CFO Thought Leader is pleased to feature this episode of the Controllers Classified Podcast, hosted by Eric Joe, Chief Accounting Officer of Brex. Some people call the IPO the Super Bowl within finance yes. and accounting. Exactly. Today, <laughs> it um, is the Super Bowl. You're uh, right. Some people also say that defending your Super Bowl championship is actually more difficult. <laughs> so tell me about after IPO, converting the socks, you know, getting those audits done, maintaining the compliance. Like, was that a big change for you guys? So I think um, uh, the, the biggest lift was socks. Welcome to Controllers Classified, the podcast where we take a deep dive into the dynamic world of controllers, accountants, and finance leaders, and hear how their ever-evolving roles are redefining accounting and the future of business. And now, here's your host, Eric Joe. Welcome to Controllers Classified. I'm your host, Eric Joe. I'm the Chief Accounting Officer at Brex. And I'm really pleased to present our guest today, Angelina Hendraka. She's a CAO at Redis and has spent an entire career leading accounting across so many different companies and industries. You've spent time at financial services and SaaS, now a data platform company. And I, I looked a little bit into your background, right? When you were an auditor, you actually worked in biotech. So a really diverse set of uh, companies there. First of all, welcome, Angelina. Thank you. And thanks for having me. It's great to be here. You just started at Redis. I'm really curious what drew you to the company and really what your plan is over the next six to month, six to 12 months there now that you've started. I was at another SaaS company, though that one is public, PowerSchool. I was there for over two years in a similar role. So the Redis CIO position kind of appealed me on two fronts. So first, it's the role itself. I joined PowerSchool about three months before their IPO after a long time of them being a private PE back company. So I, I found myself really enjoying the experience of building and scaling best in class processes, implementing systems, looking for efficiencies, getting the team ready for socks and just overall rallying the team to think ahead instead of relying on the status quo. And also there's that level of excitement that comes with seeing your company go public because that's kind of the next step in their journey. Um, so Radis is slightly an earlier stage company, not by much. So I'm super excited about the opportunity to bring what I've learned during my time scaling Power School CAO or to Radis. I actually did not know what Redis does until I heard about this role. But then I did my research, I talked to people, I found out how the product works. And I also found out that it's super popular in the developer community. So there is that product market fit, which I think is extremely important when I'm looking for my next company. Because I do believe that once you achieve that, then it's just a matter of executing on your go-to-market strategy. So your second part of the question about my focus in the next six to 12 months, it's, it's really about scaling for growth, scaling for the next phase of the company and efficiency. We have a fair idea of where the opportunities are, but it's a little bit too early right now. I'll find out more as I go spend more time with the team. And hopefully in not so distant future, based on what we discover together, then we'll get a line on the vision and the goal going forward. I have a thing that I, I work through now when I think about even my team at Brex. I won't take credit for this. This was Josh Waldron. He, he's the CAO or, or the VP of Finance, I think, at Scale AI. But he has this thing. It's called People Process Systems. And so when I think about my org, I think about, do I have the right people? Do I have the right processes? Do I have the right systems to take all that home? And so if you were to think about those three things, like, sounds like the people are great. What about the process and systems? Like, what are the processes or systems you're thinking you want to make a change on or improve, et cetera? When you say people process system, I do believe that it should be in that order, right? You need to have the people that actually execute on your vision. And then next, you look at the processes and then you can't jump ahead and look at the system because, well, you know, you can't systematize a bad process. I mean, that's that, that's really kind of my um, philosophy. So as far as the processes go, the the company is definitely able to close the books reliably and be able to kind of glean into the data and know what the stories are. There are definitely prevalence of manual processes. And so my focus would be to re-review the processes, make sure that they are appropriate. And if they are, then we will look at system solutions that can make it more efficient. You said something really interesting. If you have a bad process and you systematize it, it kind of makes it worse, right? 
Because because you've now invested all this technology to make something bad just automated, and then one day you have to unwind it. It could be pretty bad experience. I mean, from your perspective, like what are the different manual processes that you guys are going through right now that you think have the highest probability of being automated in the future? Yeah, so I think it's probably around you know the easiest or the lowest hanging fruit will be around expenses, right? Okay. So AP, T and E, you know. Quite frankly, those are also areas where there's a prevalence of tools that can help us get there. So, so that would be the first thing that I look at. And then the second one will be on the billing ops area. So these are, you know, your invoice processing, you know, making sure that when you have an opportunity that is closed and won, it kind of, you know, it translates itself to an accurate billing. And the third area would be around cash applications. How do you do it at Brex? I joined Brex. Um, five years ago, and it was straight out of big four. And so it was new to me being in industry. Um, and I talked to a lot of colleagues and a lot of people in my network about how to tackle, um, this role and how to scale Brex from like, we were 70 people at the time on QuickBooks. Now we're on NetSuite, much bigger team. And, and you know what? The, the answer back to me was very surprising from a lot of people. They all said, get your AP right. Get your AP, get your accruals right, get them done as early as possible in the cycle, because that's what hangs you up month to month. And it wasn't what I was focusing on when I was in the audit. For, I did technical accounting work. I did a lot more complex transactions. Those were all the focus, high risk areas from an audit side. But you know, when you're doing day to day, like GL management, expenses are a vast majority of the activities at the company and getting them right day to day really, it, it's, what I call it is flattening the spike. Like you don't, you can't wait till the first day of the month, second day of the month. You have to think about all those expenses throughout the month and get the work done. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, it's it's interesting. Um, you know, you were talking about um, transitioning from a big four where it's really heavy focus on technical accounting and financial reporting into a controllership slash CEO role because the role is very operational. And um, what I learned is you need to get the transactions right. Right. So because if you don't get the transactions right, you are not going to get the numbers right. I had I had something I wanted to ask you, and, and it goes back to what I was saying. You have all this experience and, and these are large public companies, right? So in financial services, in SaaS, you audited biotech companies before. Do you given like what you're saying about operational importance, do you think that's kind of like how you approach each of those jobs and why you've kind of become almost industry agnostic? Yeah, so I mean, I I do think uh, operational accounting, so corporate accounting and finance, they are all industry agnostic. And I feel like that's the beauty of it. Um, so to me, finance is the, the universal language of business, right? Um, you know, you um, that has worked out for me over the years because I was able to transition across industries pretty seamlessly. Mm -hmm. Now, there are obviously some industry-specific nuances. Um, in life sciences, you know, you have the accounting for clinical trial costs. Uh, when I moved to asset management, I was introduced to a whole new slew of um, acronyms and jargons. And then once I moved to SAS, it's all about the ARR, the MRR, the churn, the contraction, the net retention. Uh, you know, but all of these to me are just ways of measuring the state of your business using pretty much the same financial data. So um, again, it goes back to my comment earlier that you need to get the data right in order to get the numbers right, in order for you to really understand how your business is going. And then finally, in order for you to be able to tell the story to the street, to investors, to analysts, and, and, and basically to people about your growth. I really, I really uh, enjoy hearing that from you. I think, I mean, coming from now at Brex, we always talk about approaching a problem from a first principles approach. So I think what you've done is really apply first principles to each of your different jobs, right? At the end of the day, day to day, there's transaction data coming through. There's activities of the business coming through. It's not, you know, um, specific to any one industry. And so approach, yeah, I, I really, I really appreciate kind of what you, what you're saying here. Um, let's, let's, uh, switch gears just, just a little bit. Sure. Um, I know that you were on a panel recently hosted mm -hmm. by Coupa. It discussed women in the workplace and breaking down barriers to success. You know, can you tell me a little bit about your experience there and 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 what you think were the highlights of, of that panel? 
But yeah, it was a great panel. It was um, actually part of the um, Coupa user conference back in April. Um, I really had a great time prepping for it and sharing the stage with the other panelists. Um, and uh, one pretty good nugget that I got from my uh, one of my fellow panelists is around impor- imposter syndrome. Um, so it was pretty interesting, right? So most of us on the panels had what I would call a pretty traditional career, right? You graduate college, you got CPA, you spend a few years public accounting, at least for me, made transition to the industry, set in different roles, and here we are. Um, one of the panelists um, did not have this traditional career. Um, she did not come from a four-year college. She started out as an executive assistant, somehow got into an entry-level procurement specialist role, worked her way up, and then she's now a chief procurement officer at this company that was you know, previously public, um, got recently taken private for over $12 billion. So it is super inspirational for me. Um, but when she described, um, when she was going up the chain, she experienced the biggest imposter syndrome and felt the biggest amount of insecurity when people were talking about which college they went to. Um, so, and I think um, the takeaway from that is, um, you know, as a leader, I want to try to consider people from diverse backgrounds because they bring in different perspectives, right? So they may not go to a four-year college, but that does not automatically mean that they do not have the potential to be a top performer. And do you think being a woman impacted that imposter syndrome differently than a man? Like maybe it's even more so because you're kind of a minority group already in in, in the field? Yeah, so I cannot speak for her. Um, For me, definitely as I was going up the chain, it felt like, you know, I have to kind of fit into the stereotype of, being a little bit more quiet, keeping my heads down, making sure that I actually have a work that shows my capability before I can actually speak up. Now, looking back, I probably should not have felt that insecure um, earlier in my career, but you know, it's like hindsight 2020, right? And then like, what are some of the things that you think in the profession, in our functions, and, and maybe they're not specific to finance and accounting, but what are some of the things that we can do to promote some more inclusivity, to encourage maybe especially women to speak up more uh, when they have, I certainly want to hear all the good ideas. I don't care if you're a man or a woman, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Right. Like what, what, what is it that I can do better to kind of be an ally? For us, it starts from the pipeline. Um, you know, you, once you have that pipeline of diverse background and experiences, then you should be conscious about trying to draw on their experiences and perspectives and actively seek their inputs. Um, especially at the more junior slash entry level, right? They don't feel like, okay, you know, I have a CAO talking to me. Um, you know, I'll probably just, you know, agree and be okay with everything that he or she said. Um, but I think it's very important to communicate that you want to hear their voice as well. Um, and you want to create that psychological safety so nobody has to feel like they don't belong or have no business being there. Have you seen any examples of someone who's kind of trying to break down those barriers themselves? I want to encourage really everyone the same way, but maybe I should be taking time out of my day to specifically address one person or a couple of people on the team knowing that they may feel, whether it's imposter syndrome, whether they feel some way because they're a woman, like just sharing that. And you know what is um, also um, eye-opening to me is, um, I am I would like to think that I'm pretty passionate about people's development, but um, as things get really busy, you know, for you and me, and we have um, a ton of other things that we need to take care of and a lot of fires that we need to put out, um, that people development aspect of your job kind of fell by the wayside. And um, it is eye-opening because I just did a 360. And then one of the things that came out from the 360, and you know how it is with 360, right? You open the report and then you immediately zero in on the areas that you think that you're weak at. Um, and that area was people development. And then... I, I was thinking to myself, like, okay, wait a minute. I am super passionate about people development um, because, you know, I got here because I had mentors and I had managers that were investing time in me. So, um, but, 
you know, I guess whatever people's perception is completely different. And it made me step back and acknowledge the fact that, yes, that has taken the back seat because, you know, I've been so focused on getting systems in place or, um, you know, just closing the books or, um, you know, getting the company public and things like that. I, I appreciate you sharing that. I think about Rex's own growth story and then what we've been able to accomplish in accounting Getting the close down from call it two weeks, we, we we do it at five days now on the accounting side. You know, we've expanded our reporting. We have regulated statutory reports. All this required a lot of day to day work, and it's just like, you know, getting stuff done, getting tasks done. And I think yeah, like when you're in the hyper growth stage, it's obviously very important to carve out at least some time to ensure that people are doing well, to ensure that people are getting what they want out of these tasks and learning a lot to ensure that their careers are being developed. And a little goes a long way, I think, in this arena. So that's, that's a good spend management philosophy. And let's talk about where we're at today and even at Redis, okay? So you just joined this company. You know, Brex is a private company. We have 1,200 folks. Um, we're feeling the same thing that a lot of other companies are feeling. Boards across the country are saying, okay, let's make sure that every dollar that's being spent has the right ROI we need for this company. Tell me about how you're approaching kind of spend management at Redis. You and I are pretty much in the same spot, right? We are, our companies are definitely watching their spend and their cash flows. For us, how we're approaching it is a, we're still making investments, but there are just a lot more strategic and thoughtful discussions around what we should be spending, what kind of return we will get from the spend. So, you know, for example, things that will drive sales growth, absolutely. Things that are pure GNA, uh, it'll probably be on the back burner until, um, uh, you know, until, until it's absolutely necessary. Um, and then for us, we do start with a high dollar value spend. Being a software company, the, the biggest two spend is basically people and cloud. I think if you want to focus on optimizing spend, cloud is probably the one area that you should focus your time on, um, especially because it should correlate with the on-demand slash consumption-based component of the revenue. That would be the area where you would focus on, make sure that you have the right rate, make sure that you're not being paid for what you're not using. Um, and we actually have um, an effort within the company called, you know, for the lack of a better name, um, cloud optimization effort. I don't know like which cloud service provider you have, whether it's AWS or Azure or Google, like, like it doesn't really matter who it is, but like how many people do you have Focus on this effort and what's their strategy? Like, what are, what are they doing? Is it is it just monitoring? Is it making sure that servers are being used in an optimal way? You know, what what does that look like? We do have one person that is almost a hundred percent exclusively focused on our cloud spend, meaning that um, you know, if we're seeing some sort of a contraction on the revenue side, um, we want to make sure that we see the same thing on the expense side. Um, and another thing as well is um, these cloud providers have different um, uh, pricing structures, right? So it's really also looking at the pricing structures and make sure that we have the most optimal pricing structure. And that is just kind of an ongoing thing that we um, that we do. So do you have like month to month, week to week meetings with your cloud provider? Like, oh, how much is like, like Amazon has an EC2 server or like this S3? So we don't exactly have, um, you know, that high touch um, interaction with our cloud providers, but we're basically monitoring it in the back end where, you know, we're dialing things down as we need to. Um, and we're basically just watching how the expense, um, you know, hopefully the expense correlates with the revenue. Makes sense. Yeah. I mean, that's probably the biggest line item. I mean, certainly one of our biggest line items yeah. at Brex, right? Uh, what are some of the other areas that, you, that you're focusing on? I think procurement in general, right? I always say, um, you know, to my boss as well as uh, to my team, if you want to achieve what we call smart spending, i.e. spending the right amount in the right areas that will drive the business forward, um, you should invest in a good strategic procurement function. So... I'm not talking about a team or a system that handles the processing of POs. So basically like pushing papers. Um, but, uh, it's really around, um, 
you know, is there a team or is there somebody that can take a look, identify and duplicative spend across the different functions? Because, you know, like people get pretty territorial about their decision making around what to buy from who, and there can be redundancies across the org. Um, and then, you know, optimize the supplier's list and more importantly, negotiate on your behalf to get the most optimal pricing. Um, that's really when you can realize your savings. And um, the, the reason why um, I think procurement is where you should invest is because if you think about your PNL, a dollar of revenue that you grow does not translate to a dollar to the bottom line, but a dollar that you save on your spend does. So, you know, I, I have a pretty amazing strategic procurement person at my last company. And, um, uh, and that was basically what she said. And it really resonates to me. And, um, you know, I, I, I carry it forward. Wow. Um, I mean, my father said this growing up, you know, a dollar saved is a dollar earned. There you go. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. I'm really curious. So I'm going to play devil's advocate here just a little bit. And I, by the way, I 100% agree with you, but I'm going to play this role anyway. Um, how can there be a procurement person that understands all the different pricing structures for different services that we might get across all these departments? Like, why yeah. do we need a centralized person to do this when, you know, this person in, in, in business development kind of know this, knows this area the most, or these engineers kind of know the cloud service uh, space the most? Like, where do, you, where do you really get that value from? Why don't we just like let the experts handle it? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll throw, I'll, I'll throw in two words, learning agility. So, um, learning agility is the number one factor of predicting success in a new environment. Right. Um, and what it means is, um, you know, if you have learning agility and you're humble, you're self aware, you're willing to learn, you're willing to ask a ton of questions and talk to a lot of people, um, you could probably be successful. Um, so how we went about it, and you are absolutely right, right? Different, um, different areas of the organization have different spend. Um, an example is my biggest spend is my audit fees. Um, and, you know, but my audit fees is very different from, um, you know, cloud service provider. Um, the, the procurement person that I was referring to, um, you know, she obviously has had procurement background. She is, an amazingly tough negotiator. Um, and how she approaches these, um, uh, these contracts that are about to come due and about to be negotiated is she asked a lot of questions. Right. So, um, you know, we started her with, uh, I think, uh, you know, some of the, um, the SAS spend. This is back at power school. Um, and then she learns very quickly. And once she was successful with one contract, people started looking at her and be like, Hey, you know, you're not there to be in my way. You're there to actually help me manage my department budget. Um, so it's almost like a, um, uh, you know, it's, it's like a, it's, it's like a circle, right? The more she is successful, the more people are willing to engage with her. So she is not shown as a roadblock. Um, and she's actually somebody that, um, uh, that helps, um, the business safe. Um, yeah. And then a few months later, I was talking to her. I was like, Hey, can you, um, take a look at my audit piece? Um, because we're, we're about to sign this engagement letter. Uh, we're about to go to the audit committee. Um, and, and of course she knew nothing about professional services. So I talked to her about fixed fee out of scope. Um, uh, you know, the hourly rate, blended rate, basically kind of, you know, the, the whole the black box term. of fees. Yes. Of yes, fees. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I agree. I get it. Yeah. Yep. And then she basically, and, and I basically just unleashed her and then, um, and, and we were able to actually, um, when we were benchmarking against our peers, um, we actually came out pretty good. How do you add to, uh, or support the cause? Like, what are some of the things that you've done in accounting to reduce kind of your own spend? Maybe it's like actually bringing in a system so that you don't have to hire as many people. Um, or maybe it's outsourcing. Um, but like, you know, curious, curious what, how you've done it. What I've done in the past is, um, leveraging our lower cost locations. So, um, so at power school, we have a pretty robust, um, shared services center in, um, Bangalore, India. Um, and it's a captive model. So these are our employees. Um, when I came into the role, we already had a team there, um, 
performing things like, you know, Billy Ops and um, uh, collections, um, AP. And of course, there's like, you know, a separate statutory team, but, you know, they um, they kind of do their own, um, you know, finance slash accounting local for the local entity. Now, um, so what I did during my time there is um, really expanding the scope of the team that is there um, by giving them higher level work. So, for example, um, if, um, you know, at the beginning, these collections folks are only dealing with, um, you know, what we call inside sales customers. So these are your lower end customers, like smaller dollar value. Um we want them to do more of our enterprise customers that are bigger, right? So you kind of give them piecemeal, like the work is still the same, but of course the stakes are higher because you're dealing with bigger customers and then, you know, they get a lot more sensitive when you mess up, right? So, um, you know, really just kind of upskilling the team that you have in there. And um, if you have a natural attrition, then um, instead of immediately backfilling it in the U.S., um, really think about whether this role can be performed in India. So that was just a mandate that was given by our CFO. And, um, you know, we were, um, I, I would say that we were pretty good at um, being thoughtful about where to open the backfill. Let's talk about uh, some stories from the inside, like in terms of like big initiatives and projects. So you started at Power School three months before the IPO. Why don't you talk us through that process? You, so you were there, maybe the S1 was already written or, or about to be completed by the time you started or like, what was the S1 writing process like? Getting the issuance out there on the public markets, the afterwards, which some argue is even more important. What was that like? So I joined in April, 2021. Um, we eventually went in July of 2021. The S1 was ready. Um, all of the SEC comment letters were already cleared. Um, but then the S1 was about to go stale. So what I did coming in was actually updating the S1. Um, well, thankfully, we did not have to go through the SEC comment process anymore. Um, but there was a lot of interactions with our um, uh, our experts. Um, that was EY at the time. Um, our tax team, our audit team, our bankers, as well as our um, uh, attorneys. Yeah. Right. And, and for our viewers, what is the what is the comment letter process from the SEC? Like, like what's the process when you write the SEC? And oh, sorry, when you write the S one, you have to submit it, and what the SEC reviews it first? Like, how do they? Yeah. 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 That's correct. So, um, you know, we we can we have the option of submit of submitting a confidential S one, right? So you submit the confidential S one, and then they look at it, they review it, they ask questions. Um, usually, the questions are always around revenue. Um, and you know, how, what your policies are, why, you know, for example, why is it gross versus net? Um, you know, what is upfront versus deferred, like all that. So, um, you know, you have to clear that. Um, and once you're done with that process, then basically your S1 is, you know, your S1 is there. And the S1 is the prospectus, right? It's the document that you share with prospective investors, um, you know, telling them about your company so that they'll buy the issue into the issuance. Exactly. And then um, what I, uh, you know, what I was also experiencing before we went public was um, the process of roadshow. And this is 2021 when, you know, people are kind of, okay, do I want to do it in person? Do I want to do it online? Um, we ended up doing it remotely. So um, you can imagine our CFO and our CEO um, meeting back to back with various investors, um, repeating the same stories. I don't know how many times during the, um, during the road show. Um, and I think what was also smart, um, about how they approached it is we had a pretty big float. Our float is about three and a quarter billion, right? So when you have that big of a float and you are not a snowflake, um, you want to make sure that your IPO is successful. And one way of doing that is making sure that you have this so-called anchor investor. So these are investors that um, are willing to have their name be put on the prospectus um, in exchange of a guaranteed allocation of IPO shares. And the reason why you want to do that is it actually makes your case stronger. And then um, people would look at it and be like, oh, wait, um, you know, there is already an anchor investor that is committed for a sizable amount of the float. And this is um, an anchor, like actual investor. This is not one of the investment bankers that end up- No, um, no it's an actual investor. Right. Yeah. yeah, I think um, 
Oh my gosh, who was it? It's um, it's this um, investment fund called Select Equity was um, was our anchor, um, and I believe the second one was Canadian Pension Plan CPP, which is huge, right? So um, what's interesting was I never heard the term an anchor investor. I don't think that was the norm back in 2021. But, um, you know, the last three IPOs, the last three tech IPOs that we had, right? Um, Arm, uh, Clavio, and Instacart, all of them have anchor investors. And I was like, oh, hey, <laughs> anchor investors. Now I know. So, um, but yeah, so that was, um, that was kind of the process. And then, you know, a bunch of us went to New York and then, um, you know, I was, uh, I was lucky enough to be on the podium for the, um, uh, for the ringing of the opening bell. Um, uh, so that was, um, it was definitely a bucket list item. Some people call the IPO the Super Bowl within finance yeah. and accounting. Exactly. <laughs> it is a Super Bowl. You're right. Uh, some people also say that defending your Super Bowl championship is actually more difficult. So <laughs> tell me about after IPO, converting the socks, you know, getting those audits done, maintaining the compliance. Like, was that a big change for you guys? So I think um, uh, the the biggest lift was socks because um, Power School was listed in NYSC, and I believe there is a requirement that you have an internal audit function stood up by the first anniversary of your IPO. So um, immediately after we um, uh, we IPO'd, um, the effort was to actually find that internal audit head and engage a third party to be the um, almost like a lone staff or a team extension to serve as internal audit team. Um, so, and then as far as SOX goes, um, I think Power School was pretty good in that they already understood and they already documented the controls. Um, the, 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 the long pole was around the IT system because, um, you know, to me, that one is the biggest left because if you scope in certain systems that you're not ready to, you can get into a pretty bad spot. What, what, what kind of impact does that have on a software company where in a system that a, like a homegrown application that's relevant for financial reporting? Like what does that change? for the team that manages that application or system? How it changes is if it is homegrown, um, there's definitely a lot more scrutiny around the controls um, that um, that we put in place for the systems, for, for, for the systems to continue having and maintaining its integrity, right? So um, for example, if you have an outsourced system, then you can rely, well, I mean, you still need to do some work, but it's a lot less because you rely on, um, their controls audit report that says that the controls within that system is working. Yeah. And right? for, for listeners, that's that's typically called like a SOC 1 report. The SOC or, 1 report. Yeah. yeah. I feel like in SOCs, you're more likely to get a significant deficiency or a material weakness from an IT system than from a business process controls not working or not being designed well. And that's and, like, like, is it is it really like every code change has to be reviewed? I don't know the nitty gritty of that, but yes, there are, there needs to be a control around change management because you don't want a change within the system to actually affect the integrity of the data and the outputs of it, especially if the outputs are something that you rely on for financial reporting. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, remediating um, significant deficiency and material weakness within IT is a long process. So, yeah. Uh, just for our listeners out there, you know, some of the things I've seen that may or may not work for your companies, but maybe something to consider when you have an application in scope, there's a lot of code changes that still occur even after the application is live. And so sometimes some companies, they, they will classify those changes as minor or major. And so if it's a minor change, you know, it's not really that important. Like, let's we can push it through. There's not as many controls that you need over it. But if it's a major change that may impact the data integrity that's used for reporting revenue or reporting some other metric that's important to the financial statements. You know, that's when it's something that you need to get reviewed. Um, you know, you've been in, I, I haven't taken a company public yet, but like, okay, so let's just say you get a significant deficiency or a material weakness in ITGCs. Do, do people care? Does the, like, does the board really care? Like, you know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, the stock's already out there. People are trading and selling it. How does it? How does it actually economically impact the company? I mean, I think it 
you know, I, I don't know how deeply people look into this. And again, you know, I'm an accountant. Of course, I am going to look for significant deficiency and material weakness in filings, right? So I can't really tell how it does or does not impact the stock price. But, um, you know, it definitely calls into question your readiness as a public company, right? Because if you're, if you're a public company, you'd better make sure that all of these things are um, reliable, that it's going to produce a reliable result. Um, so you just don't want that doubt out there that, uh, you know, oh my gosh, uh, you know, the, the IT system is not working very well. Oh, you don't know how to, um, uh, uh, to, to, to manage changes very well. Oh, your ex- access control is not very good. Right. So, uh, you know, you definitely want to get all of those things buttoned down, um, before your first SOX filing. I mean, I've heard a couple of things on how to think about this. Wall Street Journal will from time to time report on these matters when they're when the company is significant enough and the and the finding is significant enough this has to get reported on your public filings registered with the SEC so investors see it it adds to your litigation risk potentially at the board level right so investors could sue the company because they saw that there was a material weakness and you know you couldn't rely on the financial reporting that you did so you know, you need to give me money back for this unrealized loss that I had or this realized loss that I had. Um, so yeah, there, I, I, I do think downstream there are some impacts there. Oh, for um, sure. And then when, when you mentioned um, share, uh, shareholders uh, lawsuit, um, that, that reminds me of another impact, right? Because, um, you know, when you first become public, um, your DNO, uh, the, the direct, uh, what is it? Directors and officers liability insurance just go through the roof. And as you become mature as a public company, you see the, um, you know, the premium going down. That's a real savings, right? But if you have um, an instance of, um, you know, like, uh, I don't know, like a potential threat of shareholders lawsuit, that can be part of the consideration when insurers come out and give you a quote for your next DNO. And then if you, if you have a really high DNO insurance, it, it kind of makes it tough to fill up the board sometimes with the people. That oh, absolutely. Want. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 No. So, so th- there are these, um, you know, long lasting impact, right? All right. Let's, let's end the, sh- end the show with something fun. We call the segment controllers are fun too. I mean, I, I would love to hear about a funny accounting story that you may have. I, I am still debating whether controllers are fun, but you know, I could- <laughs> By the way, the answer is no, we're not. We're totally yeah, not. Well, just but, um, be clear. but I can probably tell you um, about my um, uh, most unusual expense reports. And this is one of the last expense reports that I submitted at uh, at power school before I left. So um, I'll preface it by saying that the t e function rolls up, rolled up to me within the CAO organization. Um, and, you know, I mentioned earlier that we have India Shared Services Center, right? t e is one of the functions that are performed out of the India Shared Services Center. Um, so we have somebody there um, that's doing the day-to-day operations of expense report review, approval, and reimbursement processing. It's, it's, it's part of the uh, AP function. So um, uh, I, went, I went to India earlier in the year, didn't meet the guy, unfortunately, as he was not feeling well. Um, the week that I was there, but I heard from the team that he's very diligent and he takes his work very seriously. He has a lot of pride in his role and basically just an all around great team member, right? I mean, great. Like who, who would want people who would not want people like that? Um, anyways, I didn't know the extent of how seriously he takes his work until I came back stateside. Um, and a few months later, I submitted an expense report that got rejected because a 24 cents misclassification. So it was a parking fee that's somewhat embedded within a hotel folio that should have been broken out. So, um, you know, of course, you know, it got kicked back to me. I, um, I resubmitted the expense report and I got paid. And then, you know, later on, I was talking to the team about it and I was like, well, you gotta, you know, you gotta hear about this 24 cents misclassification thing. And then my team was like, well, you know what? He rejected the expense reports of our CEO and most okay. recently, and most recently our CPO, our chief people officer and his reason, because you need to put in reason for rejection. His reason was that the, the chief people officer's expense reimbursement was not being 
made in accordance with HR policy. And I was oh like, my gosh. she's the one that made the HR policy. Oh my gosh. I know. I know. It was a, um, a plain internet fee reimbursement that was above our limit. So there's two sides to that coin. I think, yes. I think being on this end, it's not the most pleasant experience. Yeah. But you got to respect the fact that the guy takes his job seriously. I know. Right? I know. Like that's the one person that controls kind of a little bit of the culture on the correct spend. Yep. And so if you have someone that takes it diligently, you can actually have a good impact across yep. the board on just being a little bit more responsible on your charges. And make sure that the policy has teeth. Well, Angela, it was great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in to Controllers Classified, presented by Brex. Brex is an AI-powered spend platform with global corporate cards, expense management, reimbursements, and travel. Visit brex.com and follow Brex on social to see how they can take your accounting game and your company to new heights.